Chapter 19 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathan at AntipodeanWriter.wordpress.com. The Arabian Nights Entertainments by Andrew Lang. Chapter 19 The Fourth Voyage. Rich and happy as I was after my third voyage, I could not make up my mind to stay at home altogether. My love of trading and the pleasure I took in anything that was new and strange made me set my affairs in order and begin my journey through some of the Persian provinces, having first sent off goods of stores to await my coming in the different places I intended to visit. I took ship at a distant seaport, and for some time all went well. But at last, being caught in a violent hurricane, our vessel became a total wreck in spite of all our worthy captain could do to save her, and many of our company perished in the waves. I, with a few others, had the good fortune to be washed ashore, clinging to pieces of the wreck, for the storm had driven us near an island, and scrambling up beyond the reach of the waves, we threw ourselves down, quite exhausted, to wait for morning. At daylight, we wandered inland, and soon saw some huts to which we directed our steps. As we drew near, their black inhabitants swarmed out in great numbers and surrounded us, and we were led to their houses, as it were divided among our captors. I, with five others, was taken into a hut where we were made to sit upon the ground, and certain herbs were given to us, which the blacks made signs to us to eat. Observing that they themselves did not touch them, I was careful only to pretend to taste my portion, but my companions, being very hungry, rashly ate up all that was set before them, and very soon I had the horror of seeing them become perfectly mad. Though they chattered incessantly, I could not understand a word they said, nor did they heed when I spoke to them. The savages now produced large bowls full of rice prepared with coconut oil, of which my crazy comrades ate eagerly, but only tasted a few grains, understanding clearly that the object of our captors was to fatten us speedily for their own eating and this was exactly what happened. My unlucky companions, having lost their reason, felt neither anxiety nor fear, and ate greedily all that was offered them. So they were soon fat, and there was an end of them. But I grew leaner day by day, for I ate but little, and even that little did me no good, by reason of my fear of what lay before me. However, as I was so far from being a tempting morsel, I was allowed to wander about freely, and one day, when all the blacks had gone off upon some expedition, leaving only an old man to guard me, I managed to escape from him and plunged into the forest, running faster the more he cried to me to come back, until I had completely distanced him. For seven days I hurried on, resting only when the darkness stopped me, and living chiefly upon coconuts, which afforded me both meat and drink, and on the eighth day I reached the seashore and saw a party of white men gathering pepper, which grew abundantly all about. Reassured by the nature of their occupation, I advanced towards them and they greeted me in Arabic, asking who I was and whence I came. My delight was great on hearing this familiar speech, and I willingly satisfied their curiosity, telling them how I had been shipwrecked and captured by the blacks. But these savages devour men, said they. How did you escape? I repeated to them what I have just told you, at which they were mightily astonished. I stayed with them, until they had collected as much pepper as they wished, and then they took me back to their own country, and presented me to their king, by whom I was hospitably received. To him also I had to relate my adventures, which surprised him much, and when I had finished he ordered that I should be supplied with food and raiment, and treated with consideration. The island on which I found myself was full of people and abounded in all sorts of desirable things, and a great deal of traffic went on in the capital, where I soon began to feel at home and contented. Moreover, the king treated me with special favour, and in consequence of this everyone, whether at the court or in the town, sought to make my life pleasant to me. One thing I remarked, which I thought very strange, this was that, from the greatest to the least, all men rode their horses without bridle or stirrups. I one day presumed to ask his majesty why he did not use them, to which he replied, You speak to me of things of which I have never before heard. This gave me an idea. I found a clever workman, and made him cut out under my direction the foundation of a saddle, which I wadded and covered with choice leather, adorning it with rich gold embroidery. 
and then got a locksmith to make me a bit and a pair of spurs after a pattern that I drew for him, and when all these things were completed, I presented them to the king and showed him how to use them. When I had saddled one of his horses, he mounted it and rode about quite delighted with the novelty, and to show his gratitude, he rewarded me with large gifts. After this I had to make saddles for all the principal officers of the king's household, and as they all gave me rich presents, I soon became very wealthy and quite an important person in the city. One day the king sent for me and said, Sinbad, I am going to ask a favour of you. Both I and my subjects esteem you, and wish you to end your days amongst us. Therefore I desire that you will marry a rich and beautiful lady, whom I will find for you, and think no more of your own country. As the king's will was law, I accepted the charming bride he presented to me, and lived happily with her. Nevertheless, I had every intention of escaping at the first opportunity and going back to Baghdad. Things were thus going prosperously with me when it happened that the wife of one of my neighbours, with whom I had struck up quite a friendship, fell ill and presently died. I went to his house to offer my consolations, and found him in the depths of woe. Heaven preserve you, said I, and send you a long life. Alas, he replied, what is the good of saying that when I have but an hour left to live? Come, come, said I, surely it is not so bad as all that. I trust that you may be spared to me for many years. I hope, answered he, that your life may be long, but as for me all is finished. I have set my house in order, and today I shall be buried with my wife. This has been the law upon our island from the earliest ages. The living husband goes to the grave with his dead wife, and the living wife with her dead husband. So did our fathers, and so must we do. The law changes not, and all must submit to it. As he spoke, the friends and relations of the unhappy pair began to assemble. The body, decked in rich robes and sparkling with jewels, was laid upon an open bier, and the process started taking its way to a high mountain at some distance from the city, the wretched husband clothed from head to foot in a black mantle, following mournfully. When the place of interment was reached, the corpse was lowered, just as it was, into a deep pit. Then the husband, bidding farewell to all his friends, stretched himself upon another bier, upon which were laid several little loaves of bread and a pitcher of water, and he also was let down, down, down to the depths of the horrible cavern, and then a stone was laid over the opening, and the melancholy company wended its way back to the city. You may imagine that I was no unmoved spectator of these proceedings. To all the others it was a thing to which they had been accustomed from their youth up, but I was so horrified that I could not help telling the king how it struck me. Sire, I said, I am more astonished than I can express to you at the strange custom which exists in your dominions of burying the living with the dead. In all my travels I have never before met with so cruel and horrible a law. What would you have, Sinbad? he replied. It is the law for everybody. I myself should be buried with the Queen if she were the first to die. But your Majesty, said I, dare I ask if this law applies to foreigners also? Why, yes, replied the King, smiling in what I could but consider a very heartless manner, there are no exceptions to the rule if they have married in the country. When I heard this, I went home much cast down, and from that time forward my mind was never easy. If only my wife's little finger ached, I fancied she was going to die, and sure enough, before very long she fell really ill, and in a few days breathed her last. My dismay was great, for it seemed to me that to be buried alive was even a worse fate than to be devoured by cannibals. Nevertheless, there was no escape. The body of my wife, arrayed in her richest robes and decked with all her jewels, was laid upon the bier. I followed it, and after me came a great procession, headed by the king and all his nobles, and in this order we reached the fatal mountain, which was one of a lofty chain bordering the sea. Here I made one more frantic effort to excite the pity of the king and those who stood by, hoping to save myself even at this last moment, but it was of no avail. No one spoke to me. They even appeared to hasten over their dreadful task, and I speedily found myself descending into the gloomy pit, with my seven loaves and picture of water beside me. Almost before I reached the bottom, the stone was rolled into its place above my head, and I was left to my fate. A feeble ray of light shone into the cavern through some chink, and when I had the courage to look about me, I could see that I was in a vast vault, bestrewn with bones and bodies of the dead. I even fancied that I heard the expiring sighs of those who, like myself, had come into this dismal place alive. 
all in vain did i shriek aloud with rage and despair reproaching myself for the love of gain and adventure which had brought me to such a pass but at length growing calmer i took up my bread and water and wrapping my face in my mantle i groped my way towards the end of the cavern where the air was fresher here i lived in darkness and misery until my provisions were exhausted but just as i was nearly dead from starvation the rock was rolled away overhead and i saw that a buyer was being lowered into the cavern and that the corpse upon it was a man in a moment my mind was made up the woman who followed had nothing to expect but a lingering death i should be doing her a service if i shortened her misery therefore when she descended already insensible from terror i was ready armed with a huge bone one blow from which left her dead and i secured the bread and water which gave me a hope of life several times did i have recourse to this desperate expedient and i know not how long i had been a prisoner when one day i fancied that i heard something near me which breathed loudly turning to the place from which the sound came i dimly saw a shadowy form which fled at my movement squeezing itself through a cranny in the wall i pursued it as fast as i could and found myself in a narrow crack among the rocks along which i was just able to force my way i followed it for what seemed to me many miles and at last saw before me a glimmer of light which grew clearer every moment until i emerged upon the seashore with a joy which i cannot describe when i was sure that i was not dreaming i realized that it was doubtless some little animal which had found its way into the cavern from the sea and when disturbed had fled showing me a means of escape which i could never have discovered for myself i hastily surveyed my surroundings and saw that i was safe from all pursuit from the town the mountains sloped sheer down to the sea, and there was no road across them. Being assured of this, I returned to the cavern and amassed a rich treasure of diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and jewels of all kinds which strewed the ground. These I made up into bales, and stored them into a safe place upon the beach, and then waited hopefully for the passing of a ship. I looked out for two days, however, before a single sail appeared, so it was with much delight that I at last saw a vessel not very far from the shore, and by waving my arms and uttering loud cries succeeded in attracting the attention of her crew. A boat was sent off for me, and in answer to the questions of the sailors as to how I came to be in such a plight, I replied that I had been shipwrecked two days before, but had managed to scramble ashore with the bales which I pointed out to them. Luckily for me, they believed my story, and without even looking at the place where they found me, took up my bundles and rowed me back to the ship. Once on board, I soon saw that the captain was too much occupied with the difficulties of navigation to pay much heed to me, though he generously made me welcome, and would not even accept the jewels with which I offered to pay my passage. Our voyage was prosperous, and after visiting many lands and collecting in each place great store of goodly merchandise, I found myself at last in Baghdad once more with unheard of riches of every description. Again I gave large sums of money to the poor, and enriched all the mosques in the city, after which I gave myself up to my friends and relations with whom I passed my time in feasting and merriment. Here Sinbad paused, and all his hearers declared that the adventures of his fourth voyage had pleased them better than anything they had heard before. Then they took their leave, followed by Hindbad, who had once more received a hundred sequins, and with the rest had been bidden to return next day for the story of the fifth voyage. When the time came, all were in their places, and when they had eaten and drunk of all that was set before them, Sinbad began his tale. End of chapter 19 Recording by Nathan at antipodeanwriter.wordpress.com